patient, Peter Ingram. Is this thing on? Right, so my name is Peter. Peter to my friends, but heck, I killed all my friends. So go ahead, call me Peter. I'll just tell you from the get-go that I am crazy. Certified insane. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? They don't lock anyone away in Bainbridge Asylum unless they're out of their mind. No matter what some of the other patients would have you believe, out of their minds and violent. Only four of my personalities are violent, really. But we all agree that I am right where I belong. I don't think of myself as a violent man, but I do get enjoyment out of seeing how creative my alter egos are when they spill the blood of others. Feel free to judge me. It doesn't matter. Anyway, you're not here to listen to me prattle on about my personal issues, right? You're here to learn about some of the strange things going on at this noble old building that we, the condemned crazies, call home. I'm sure you'll be tempted to pass off a lot of what I say as nonsensical drivel consecrated in the disturbing halls of a broken mind. But listen here. I'm insane, but I'm not stupid. I'm not a liar, nor have I ever suffered from hallucinations aside from when I was under the influence of illicit drugs. I won't pretend to understand everything that's went on, but I know what I saw. I know the truth, no matter what the eggheads have to say about it. Right, so we aren't being allowed a ton of time for this interview, so I'll just share with you the scariest thing I've ever witnessed here, or anywhere for that matter. It happened on a day, not too long ago, during lunch. I was being allowed to join some of my fellow crazies in the cafeteria, B2 of the B Ward, which is where we get to eat lunch when the eggheads are fairly certain we're not going to cause trouble. I get to eat there when I'm Peter, because I never cause trouble. Like I said, I'm not a liar, sometimes even when I'm not Peter, so after 15 years, They've come to trust that I am who I say I am when I'm asked. I only change after sleeping or after a seizure, so they know I won't suddenly decide to hurt someone or anything like that. On the whole, I'm probably one of the easiest patients to take care for. Except when I'm Henry. Things always get a lot more exciting and dangerous when I'm him. Anyway. That day at lunch, I decided to sit near Mason, a relative newcomer to the nut house. He had apparently worked in construction until the day he had killed and partially ate two of his co-workers on the job. Cannibalism really isn't my cup of tea, but Mason is a nice enough guy when the voices in his head aren't urging him to eat flesh of the chosen. He's pretty laid back on a normal day so it's easy to see when he's worked up and fighting his demons. Even Henry knows to keep his distance then. But this day, he was fine. So I sat down to his left, being careful to leave two empty seats between us. You always have to leave two seats open on either side of him in case his dead co-workers are in attendance. Hey Mason, I said. I heard you had a visitor this morning. Peter, he asked, eyeing me cautiously. The one and only, I answered, chuckling lightly to let him know there was no danger here. Right, he said, turning his attention back to the food on his plate. Yeah, the wife came by with my kid. He chewed on a baby carrot in silence for a moment and then sighed. She still won't talk to me, or even look in my direction, you know? My boy. He tries to be all cheerful like, but I can tell he isn't comfortable with the way me and his mom are. I can still see his love for me shining in his eyes, but there's also a lot of sadness there. 
I expect it won't do him much good to keep seeing me in this place, but what can I do, man? They won't ever let me go back home. Hmm, I grunted in agreement, swallowing a mouthful of mashed potatoes. Well, at least he doesn't have to stay here, anyway. Not like that kid Galloway. Thank God for small favors, he laughed. Do you know that Galloway's kid's father still tries to get them to allow him a one-on-one -on -one visit with his son? My boy even tried to kill me like what Galloway did to his dad. Ha. They wouldn't have to worry about his sorry butt here. He'd be sitting comfortably at the bottom of a six-foot concrete grave. Ain't it the truth, I smiled, chugging down half the milk in my cup. Honestly, I'm not sure I shared Mason's sentiment about Galloway. If I'd ever had a son, I might be proud to have one who accomplished what that boy had. Even if I had to become one of his victims, I can only imagine the fun I might have had with the little pup to raise. Peter? Mason gasped suddenly, staring at the spot above and behind me. I, uh, he stammered. His left eye started to twitch. Do you see that thing? It, I, it's not one of mine. I don't know. I don't usually like to involve myself in other wackos' psychological misfires. But something about the look in his eyes made me think it would be wise to take a look for myself. There was a very distinct feeling of something dangerous lurking behind me that made me instinctively want to protect my spine. Or maybe it wasn't a feeling so much as the naked terror written on Mason's face that got me. I quickly whipped my head around to see what was going on, and I yelped in shock at the vision before me. Again, I freely admit I am insane, and I know that you'll be disinclined to fully believe my account of this incident, but I know what I saw. I know that Mason and I witnessed the same thing, with no possible explanation for that except for us actually having seen it with our own eyes. This was no hallucination. And as far as I know, hallucinations don't typically kill people. Not directly, anyway. Just please bear with me and listen to my whole story before you shut off the recorder and make on to the next crazy. You don't have to believe me, but just listen. What I saw, I kid you not, was a little old granny plastered most of the way up the wall behind our table. Like seriously. The face was that of the stereotypical old white grandma with friendly wrinkles and laugh lines, sparkling blue eyes and uh, what's the word? Benevolent, benevolent smile on her small lips. Her long silver hair was done up in a messy bun atop her head, and her earlobes were adorned with small pearl earrings. The reading glasses, resting across the bridge of her nose, added a touch of charming intelligence. It was the kind of face that automatically brought to mind images of freshly baked cookies and homemade lemonade. Story time by the fireplace, magical purses, and peppermint candies. I might as well have been pleasantly surprised if it hadn't been for the rest of her. The granny wore no clothes, from her neck down. She was long and fleshy, almost like a slug. In her absence of limbs, her skin looked like the exact color and texture of a thawed door-bought plucked chicken. The edges of her skin where it connected with the wall were an almost lavender shade of purple, and they flapped and undulated lightly as though disturbed by a breeze. Where she moved a little closer to us, 
Her motion was more snake-like than sluggish in its quickness, and side-to-side -side action. I jerked back in surprise and knocked over my cup of milk, but never let my eyes leave the horror of the wall. I felt Mason's strong hands grip my shoulders and pull me close to him. Dead co-workers be damned. Hey, what's the problem over here? Came the booming voice of Mr. Manny, one of the security guards from our ward. He stepped in front of us with his hands hovering menacingly over both his club and his taser. I couldn't fathom how he hadn't seen the thing on the wall on his way over to us, but I tried my best to draw his attention to the problem by wildly gesturing in its direction. Mason only tightened his fearless grip on me as we both wordlessly trembled. Mr. Manny only grunted in frustration and reached for his walkie-talkie, presumably to call for some assistance in getting us out of the cafeteria before we could cause a disturbance. The granny never gave him a chance. Quickly slithering down closer to the guard, the creature shot two thick, long tendrils out of her mouth and wrapped them around his neck. Mr. Manny's arm shot down to his side, and he went completely rigid as the granny turned him to face her and pulled him in closer. He looked completely terrified, and I'm sure he would have screamed his head off if he had been allowed to make a sound. As it was, it appeared the awful monstrosity had him under some kind of paralysis with her hold, and all he could do was stare helplessly and wet his pants. The granny gazed at him lovingly, as would a grandmother dotting on her beloved grandchild, cooing softly as the ends of her tendrils stroked his cheek. The end of the tender moment finally came when two smaller appendages with long rudimentary fingers emerged from under the monster's chin. The fingers held long, sharp knitting needles that looked to be made of the same substance as her body, and I couldn't help but think they looked fitting for a nightmare grandma. The way she popped those knitting needles into Mr. Manny's eyes, however, seemed unbecoming of any grandmother outside of hell. It was only after the horrid act that Mr. Manny was finally able to let out a piercing, agonizing scream. Out of my mind with terror, I wildly looked around the room, hoping to see other guards running over to deal with the grotesque, elderly abomination on the wall. Unbelievably, no one else in the room seemed to notice anything out of the ordinary. Not the other patients, not the guards, not the orderlies, or other staff present in the cafeteria. Mason and I were the only unfortunate witnesses of this ghoulish event. It was as if we had somehow been moved just out of reach of the mundane world for a personal show of insanity beyond comprehension. A painful tightening of Mason's grip on my shoulder brought my attention back to that which I wish I could unsee. I don't know how to properly explain what I saw next. Even now, I find it difficult to wrap my mind around what the granny creature did to Mr. Manny. The best way I can describe it is to say that she unraveled him. He came apart like a ball of yarn as she worked him over and used his unraveled flesh to knit a hooded covering for her body. She used some of his bones for accents in her bloody garment fashioning them into buttons and flower-like patterns. She let his internal organs and uniform fall to the floor in an unused pile of gore. Afterwards, the monster doned her cloak, retracted her appendages, and looked approvingly at her handiwork. Then, she kindly smiled at us and slithered her way back up the wall and into an open vent in the ceiling. 
only after Mason let out of his hold on me to collapse to the floor. In blessed unconsciousness, did I finally manage a proper scream of my own, almost like some spell had been broken when the creature had left the room. The entire cafeteria suddenly became aware of the chaos happening in our section. The bloody remains that used to be Mr. Manny's caused everyone to fly into a panic, with some of the other crazies becoming violent at the sight of the carnage. I just sat screaming through it all until a seizure stole me away and Patricia took my place. From what I hear, she had found a good place to hide until things settled down and the patients were taken out of there. So anyway, the story that everyone is being fed about the incident is that an unnamed psycho in the ward managed to sneak into the cafeteria and kill the guard who discovered him. No explanation of how this random sicko reduced Mr. Manny to such a state without being noticed by the rest of the people in the room. Manny and my accounts are discredited because we're insane, of course. And who wouldn't believe it, even if we weren't? I don't know. Maybe I'm just crazier than I thought, and none of what I saw was real. But then, why did the director of Bainbridge suddenly decide to resign after that? What did he see on the security footage that day? Believe me, that man has seen a lot of messed up stuff in all his years of working here. What was it that finally pushed him over the edge? Man, I just don't know anymore. Anyway, that's all I've got for you. If you ever want to know about the other weird things I've seen in this place, you know where to find me. I just wish that wasn't here anymore in Bainbridge. I've been in this place for a long time, but now things just don't feel much like home anymore. I don't really feel safe here anymore, you know? Well, good luck to whomever you peg to be the next director of this crazy farm. He's gonna need it. Security Guard Aaron Mackey My name is Aaron Mackey. I'm 38 years old, been working security for about 10 years now. I graduated from an Ivy League university with a fancy degree in English, but that didn't put food on the table. So here I am. I used to work the prison up north, but my wife got a nice promotion at her job and we could finally afford to buy a house in a nicer neighborhood out this way. My buddy who also worked security, put in a good word for me here at Bainbridge Asylum, and I was hired within a week of moving to my new place. The pay raise I took by signing onto this place is just about worth the hassle, if not entirely fulfilling. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad to have found employment here. It's just that Bainbridge is weird. I mean, it's an insane asylum, so you're bound to see some crazy stuff happen, more often than not. But some things that go on here are strange even for a place that houses the criminally insane. I've only been working here for about four months, but I've already seen my fair share of unexplainable occurrences, one of which I'll share with you here. Now, before you get to asking, I'm not going to talk about what happened to Officer Manny. I personally never met the guy because we'd never worked the same wards. I work primarily in D Ward, which is where we care for the elderly patients. For reasons never explained to me, Officer Manny was no longer permitted access to D Ward, though he had worked many a night shift there prior to me joining the security team. From what little I've heard, he maybe wasn't as gentle as he should have been when dealing with some of the more fragile or sickly old people here. As far as the nature of his death, I only know what upper management has told everyone, though there are some interesting theories floating around the building that contradict the memo we all received. Anyway, 
instead of wasting your time with hearsay about something that doesn't relate to me, I'll tell you about something abnormal that I've actually witnessed. Now, for the most part, I'm strictly a day shift worker. I sometimes cover shifts in other wards, but I almost never work nights. I like to get my work done while my wife is working and my daughters are at school, so we can all spend our evening together as a family. This is really important to me since I work weekends and I want to spend as much time with my girls as possible. I've only volunteered to work a night shift once, and that was because my wife took the girls to visit her parents for a weekend. Now, my in-laws are good people, but I can only take them in small doses. You know how it is. Anyway, that night, I was assigned to work in Sea Ward which houses a lot of patients undergoing experimental treatments. I won't lie, that ward gives me the creeps, even in the bright light of day. I was not looking forward to spending my time there after the sun went down. But as they say, beggars can't be choosers. Honestly, the shift started out much quieter than I was expecting. With the chaotic noises of the day becoming more subdued by the hour, I was actually kind of enjoying myself since I was paired up with Officer Franklin for the night rounds. Remember that buddy that helped me acquire this position? Yeah, that's Franklin. He's a solid dude, quick, reliable, and funny as hell. With him there, I might as well have decided to pull a few more night shifts on the sea ward. Unfortunately, I happened upon a situation that might keep me off of nightly duty for the foreseeable future, especially on that ward. It was around 3 a.m. when Franklin and I went to do our fourth patrol of the mostly slumbering ward. There were a lot of nocturnal patients pacing their rooms or drawing weird pictures or doing whatever else crazy people think to do in the wee hours of the morning. Since there wasn't much going on at that hour, Franklin and I decided to split up and check on different corridors to get the patrol done faster. That isn't standard procedure, of course. But sometimes, this job has a way of lulling you into feeling like things are safer than they really are. Anyway, Franklin took the east wing while I went to check out the west wing. You might already be familiar with Bainbridge's peculiar room numbering system, which apparently stemmed from some superstitions of original design. All patients' rooms are given even numbers. In fact, the only odd numbers you'll find in the building are in storage and maintenance rooms. No one has ever told me of any exceptions to this rule, and I have no reason to believe that there are any, except that night. I'm sure I saw something that maybe wasn't supposed to be there. I mean, it wasn't there. It couldn't have been. And yet, as I went down the corridor, I did my usual peeking into the windows of each room to make sure nothing alarming, let's say, with any of the patients. C20 was sleeping, C22 was sleeping, C24 was sitting up in bed, staring at his hand with a terrified expression on his face, nothing unusual there. C26 was sleeping, C27 was C27. I stepped back away from the door and stared up at the number tile above it, C27. I looked to the left and the right of it, and sure enough, C27 sat between C26 and C28. It wasn't usual to find storage rooms among the patient's rooms, but this one had a door that looked just like a patient's room door, complete with an observation window. I was pretty sure I didn't notice such an anomaly during any of the previous rounds, but there was always the chance that I had simply missed it. Anyhow, there it was, and I still had a job to do, so I cautiously approached the door to C27 and looked in. The patient in room C27 was standing in front of the wall outside the door, facing away from me with his arms outstretched and palms pressed against the wall. 
there was a large, ornate drawing of a leafless tree that covered most of the wall's surface. Beautifully detailed, and drawn entirely in a rust-colored ink or paint. The patient himself wore no clothes and was almost skeletal in appearance. His taut skin was bone white, and I could see the outline of every rib growing out of his prominent spine. His very visible blood vessels all seemed to be in motion, squeezing rhythmically, as though pushing all of his blood to his hand via peristalsis. The great tree on the wall seemed to be growing even larger, as if fed from the blood of that man. I didn't know what to do. There was something seriously wrong going on in C-27, and I felt ill-equipped to do anything about it. I did feel like I should probably get the patient away from that tree though. So I took out my keycard and went to unlock the door. Looking down, I was shocked to see that there was nowhere for my keycard to go. The doorknob had an old-fashioned keyhole in it, unlike any other patient room door I've ever seen in this place. I grabbed the knob and tried to turn it, but it wouldn't budge. I jiggled the knob and jerked at the door a few times before giving up and looking back to the window. I nearly choked on my own tongue when I saw the patient's face a few inches away from mine on the other side of the glass. The man looked furious, with his thin, wide mouth contorted into a vicious snarl. His blue eyes looked feral, wide open with tiny pupils and yellowed sclera. The skin on his face had been stretched so thin that it had ripped open in several places. His long, blonde hair hung in wispy strands from his patchy scalp. The few teeth he still had embedded in his shriveled up gums were blackened with rot, and his tongue was a sickly purple color. I suddenly didn't want to open the door. In fact, I hoped with everything in me that the door was incapable of opening. I started to back away slowly, but then quickened my pace when the man in the room smashed his forehead into the window. I tripped over my own feet in my haste and cried out as I hit the floor hard with my right hip. I cried out again as his head forcibly hit the window a second time. Breaking away the glass barrier, I screamed bloody murder when the guy started climbing and pushing his thin frame through the opening. At the sound of running footsteps coming in my direction, I turned to see Franklin sprinting to my rescue. He skidded to a halt right in front of me, blocking my view and approaching the horror. Mackie, what's going on? He yelled, sweeping his flashlight around to look for trouble. Behind you, I wheezed. Coming out of C-27. C-27? Mackie, there's no C-27. Franklin said with ample concern on his face as he looked me over. He stepped aside so that we could both look at the place I had been facing. There was, of course, nothing there except for a blank wall situated between C-26 and C-28. No way, I yelled as I scrambled to my feet and made my way over to the wall on wobbly legs. I felt the hard permanence of the wall under my palms and shook my head at the craziness of the situation. No way, I cried, refusing to believe that my mind had just made all of that up. No way, I said more softly, feeling defeated but also relieved. I let Franklin guide me gently away from the wall and back towards C Ward, security office. We didn't say anything the whole way there, and I didn't even feel like I could look my friend in the eyes, for fear that he might see insanity in mine. Listen, Franklin said, once we were back in the office and had found a corner to ourselves. Don't tell the others what you saw tonight, he told me nodding his head in the direction of the other officers there. No one will think you're crazy for it, given the strange things we've all seen around here from time to time. But they will give you crap, probably a new nickname for it, especially if they find out that you scream like a little girl. 
But you don't know what I saw, I argued feebly. How do you know I didn't legitimately lose my marbles out there? Like I said, he sighed, placing a hand on my shoulder. We've all seen things. It really doesn't matter what you saw specifically. Sometimes it's best not to look too closely though. It takes getting used to. But when you see things at Bainbridge that defy reason, like a room that shouldn't be there, take note of it and move on. You understand? Whatever you just saw, let it go. You don't want to go so far down that rabbit hole that you end up occupying one of the rooms here yourself. Some things here extend beyond the scope of your job. You leave those things well enough alone and you'll be alright. Franklin, I breathed, shaking my head wonderingly. Why the hell would you sign me up for a job like this? You're a tough guy, Mackie. I knew you could handle it, he said dismissively. Reaching into a nearby cabinet, he grabbed two snacks and pushed one towards me. Want a bear claw? Look, whatever you may think about my story, just know that this place is not for the faint of heart. The last director undoubtedly knew that and was able to tough it out here for a mighty long time. I don't even want to know what would chase a man like him out of this place. But the next director had better be someone tough as nails. Someone who will be okay with taking a closer look at the things that the rest of us aren't paid enough to do. I sure wouldn't want to be the one to do it. I pity the one you find. Patient Alicia Barnes I'm Alicia Barnes. I'm not supposed to be here, you know. They put me in here because I'm a witch. But stake burning is no longer allowed. Sure, I've killed a few men. But it was only because I needed their body parts for my spells. So sue me or whatever. And those kids at the park had to die because they got a particular ritual wrong. Their souls had become corrupted, and they would have slaughtered the whole city. I know I'm into some dark stuff, but that doesn't mean I want to be the cause of the world's demise. It wasn't my fault that those idiots didn't follow my instructions to the letter, but I was the one to introduce them to the ritual. So their killing spree would have been on me. So yeah, you're welcome. If I had let that group live, you would probably be dead now. So, the story is that our esteemed director has decided to resign, right? That's a load of bull. I have it on good authority that he's still here at Bainbridge Asylum. You know, the one thing that really used to grind my gears about this place was that someone like me had to languish here under the label of insanity while someone like him got to run the place. Do you have any idea what kind of dark stuff that guy was into? I'm willing to bet he murdered a lot more people than I ever have. That's the only way you reach the depths of depraved power he had reached. Well, now it's not so bad since he's stuck here now as much as I am. Maybe even more so. I heard he got his very own secret room on the Sea Ward. Serves him right. You're probably wondering why I don't witch my way out of this place, right? Well, Bainbridge is a pretty magical place and has its own rules that need to be followed. Before I got locked up here, I had actually become well versed on the lore that surrounds the asylum. I loved hunting down places with dark histories, and this asylum was close to where I lived. So naturally, I learned a lot about it. Are you aware that Bainbridge is built right on top of the site of Brisbane's massacre? Over 200 people dead and buried right underneath our feet? Look it up. It's a fascinating story. The original founders of the asylum 
were said to have been a group of necromancers who were building a school here dedicated to furthering their research on raising the dead. Okay, I know that's not what the official history states about them, but I looked to more truthful sources for my information. Anyway, the design of this building follows a set of rules that governs the behavior of the magic here. Admittedly, I had not quite figured out how all of it works yet. The master I serve is not allowed to assist me in my endeavors to discover the inner workings of Bainbridge's power. The energies expressed here are downright perplexing and often more dangerous than I'm used to handling. I somehow don't think that the original founders accomplished whatever it was that they were trying to achieve. It's like they omitted something important or they mistranslated an important ritual from one of the old textbooks. It seems like they unintentionally created a powerful, malevolent, intelligent, but confused beast when they built Bainbridge. Now no one can control it or figure it out. Just ask the last director. I suppose I'll go on and tell you about my near-death experience here. It has been labeled a suicide attempt, of course. But, I can tell you that I've never been suicidal in my life. Believe me, I know where my master comes from. I'm in no hurry to get there. And, though my master won't outright confirm my suspicions, I fear that if I die in this asylum, I won't get to leave. My own energy will just become another awful part of this place. And that's not something I'm overly eager to face. Nothing in my life is so bad that I'm willing to forfeit it for any afterlife I can imagine for myself. I used to really enjoy exploring Bainbridge at night. This building is a secretive place. But at night, it lets its hair down and allows itself to really be seen by those who are inclined to look. Yes, I have my ways of getting out of my room at night. No, I'm not going to reveal them. Just know that the walls and doors are a lot more porous than they appear, and that I haven't yet met a room that can hold me or keep me out if I had a mind to exit or enter. Unfortunately, many of the entities that exist within these walls can boast the same prowess, so escaping unwanted visitors can be a tricky thing. That wasn't too much of a problem for me until I almost got myself killed. That night, I decided to explore all walled off sections of A Ward that most people don't know about. According to the Dark Historians, this area is known as the Rush. Thanks to some confused bit of magic, time runs more quickly than usual in there. And I don't mean just the time on your watch would be speeding by. Everything moves as if on permanent fast forward, like something is rushing to get everything to where it is going. It's a very strange phenomenon to think about, let alone to experience. I thought it would be the coolest thing to check out for myself, but it never occurred to me that something might live there. I truly regret having opened that can of worms. As it turns out, the rush isn't really that impressive when you're in it. To an outside observer, it would look amazing, but for the people inside the rush, everything appears to be normal because everything is moving at increased speed, including your thoughts. Nothing seems to be moving differently. That realization was a bit of a letdown for me, but it was still neat to feel the unique energy of the place and to discover all of the things that had been left behind in the haste to cover it up. Surprisingly, there wasn't much dust or any real signs of decay about the area, and not a single bug or cobweb to be seen. A few sounds of scurrying alerted me to the presence of mice or rats within the walls, but I didn't notice droppings anywhere. The floors in the area looked like some kind of off-white linoleum, Unlike the pink and baby blue vinyl tile currently used by the rest of the asylum. Also, unlike the rest of the asylum, 
The doors to the rooms were made of a dark brown, heavy wood. Instead of windows to look through, each door had a small opening with a sliding barrier for observation. The doorknobs were old and wooden, with a keyhole resting beneath each one. None of the doors I tried were locked, which meant I could have a look around without having to waste energy on creative entering. I guess the ease of entering made me forget caution, as I'd never even bothered to look through the observation hole before opening a door. The first room I entered was furnished with a wooden bed frame that was bolted to the wall and a small wooden desk that was bolted to the floor. The walls were plastered with crayon drawings of flowers, rainbows, and an assortment of bugs and animals. On the desk sat a few professional looking sketches of the very walls of the room with all of the drawings present. All of the cutesy pictures on the wall made me gag, but I was rather fond of the sketches. I pocketed one to take with me and moved on to the next room. The only furniture present in the second room was a single wooden chair sitting in the room's center, facing away from the door. In the chair sat a large orange and yellow teddy bear that looked like it was homemade. The fabric and pattern of its skin seemed consistent with what a woman might use for a summer dress. The one remaining button eye on its face was yellow and shaped like a flower. The nose was a black felt material, while the stitching that created its smile was brown. A syringe filled with a dark substance punctured the bear's face where the missing eye would have been. I could feel that the bear was very angry, so I picked it up and squeezed it against my chest, taking some of its burden into myself before returning to its chair. I know. I'm such a sentimental fool sometimes, but the bear appreciated it, and I left the room better than I found it. The third room was trouble. When I put my hand on the doorknob of the room, I felt something that should have at least gotten me to take a peek into the room before opening the door. It felt wrong. I didn't know of any other way to describe it. If I had been anywhere else except for Bainbridge, that feeling would have caused me to walk away unless my master had made a specific request for me to bypass that decision. I think the overall strangeness of this asylum and its various energies has weakened my inhibitions to a degree. Or maybe I've just grown stupider over the years. Whatever the reason for my lack of caution, I opened the door to the third room and stepped right in. The first thing that grabbed my attention was the number of walls. I mean, it almost seemed like the walls themselves were completely made of numbers. Numbers on top of numbers. Big, small, different colors, even numbers in different languages. Some of them were so ornate that they wouldn't have looked out of place in an art museum. Others were crudely carved into the wall, still. Others looked like ethereal caveman paintings. Even though I couldn't read all of them, it didn't take me long to understand that all of the numbers were odd that didn't bode well in a place like this. So I quickly decided to take my leave. I actually might have left the room unscathed, except that I suddenly noticed that there was a fully intact bed on the right side of the room and the bed was occupied. Sitting Indian style on the red duvet that covered the mattress was a young man that looked to be about my age, which is to say a little bit older than someone fresh out of college. Yeah, I know, I look old for my age. It happens when you live a life like mine. Anyway, the guy didn't have a shirt on, but he was wearing what looked like white scrub bottoms. His flawlessly chiseled body might have been a real turn on if his skin wasn't this awful grayish blue color. His lips, nipples, fingernails, and toenails were tar black. 
He had no hair on any part of his body that was visible to me. His irises were a crystal clear blue, while the whites of his eyes were the bright red of arterial blood. Whoa, who are you? I spat in surprise, without thinking about whether it was safe to start a conversation with this guy or not. Whoa, he croaked, leaning forward a little and cocking his head to the side. Who are you? His voice was soft and somewhat pleasant, but it sounded like he hadn't spoken in a long time and he might have been thirsty. I'm, uh, I'm Oria. I lied, giving him the name that I usually gave to supernatural entities I encountered. There is power in names, so you should never give your name away lightly. No, he said sitting up straight and narrowing his eyes at me. That's no strike. Why have you come here? He probed. Uh, I paused for a moment, unsure of what game we might be playing here. I could sense that just leaving was no longer an option. Not now that I had his attention. I decided to just be honest for that moment since I wasn't yet sure what kind of danger this entity represented. I was curious. I had heard about this area called the Rush, and I decided to do some exploring. Yes, he sighed. The Rush is my home. There is a wall that keeps out the living. How did you get in? I took a path hidden to most. Walls are no real barrier for me, I replied carefully. I'm sorry if my presence has disturbed your peace. Are you able to leave here? I wondered. That's another strike, he growled, burying his red teeth in anger. Your question is not valid. You may try another question, but it's probably not a good idea. His angry scowl transformed into a sly grin as his eyes traveled along the numbered wall before resting back on me. Are you odd or even? he asked. What? I spurted. I... I don't understand the question. How can I be odd or even? At this point, I knew there was no way. I was going to pass whatever test this was, so I started trying to calculate how quickly I could get from here to the other side of the wall that sealed the rush away from the rest of Bainbridge. The panic rising in my chest made it difficult to think about all the steps needed to get out of there. You're nervous, little rabbit, aren't you? He chuckled. Don't worry, you're an odd number, for sure. An even number couldn't have entered this room. The door would have been locked to you. That was, of course, your last strike. But fortunately for you, that means that you'll be able to stay here with me forever and always. Before I could react, the entity's hands shot out across the room and wrapped themselves firmly around my neck. He never left his place upon his bed, nor did he change his seated position. His arms had merely extended as much as they needed to in order to close the distance between us, and now they began to drag me over to him. There wasn't much time to think because we weren't a great distance away from each other, and because he wouldn't let me draw in a breath. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the little folding knife I kept on me when I was exploring the building. No, I won't tell you where I keep it stashed during the day. I dug my heels into the floor, trying to buy myself time while I geared up to do whatever was necessary. That little knife wasn't likely to even scratch the surface of the entity's skin, 
but my master had left me a way to protect myself under the most extreme circumstances. I would have to get good and deep for it though. Working as quickly as I could, I stabbed the knife into my left wrist and dragged it up my forearm, hoping beyond hope that it would be enough. Growing weaker by the second, I desperately beat my arm against his, splashing my blood all over him. Blessed air rushed into my lungs as the entity released me, his lengthened arms flailing about as he howled in pain. I fell to the floor feeling dizzy and disoriented, but knowing that I could probably die if I stayed where I was for too much longer. I got to my feet and exited the room as quickly as I could, slammed the door shut behind me. The deafening roars chasing me out of the room spurred me on. As I spent all that I had pushing myself towards the wall through which I needed to escape, I had almost reached the barrier when the world around me faded into black halls of unconsciousness. I'm still not sure about how I managed to get out of the rush. Apparently one of the night patrols found me bleeding to death on the floor of one of the sea ward corridors. Now I live in E ward, the suicide ward. I don't mind it here, honestly. I don't get to spend much time alone anymore, which I'm okay with. My nightly explorations are over. I happily take the sedatives offered to me and sleep like a normal person now. I'm sure the day might come when I feel comfortable enough to take on another adventure in the dark. But then again, maybe not. Bainbridge is just too powerful and too unpredictable. It just doesn't feel safe to explore anymore. Look, I know that you probably don't believe a word of what I just said. I mean, witches, dark magic, and things that go bump in the night right? But you need to warn the next director. This place is not to be trifled with. Here, there are monsters. I had to damn near kill myself in order to save my own life. Bainbridge Asylum will devour you, digest you, and here you will stay. Patient, Bethany Stalwart. Wait, are you recording this? I... I don't think I can do this. You probably won't believe me anyway. And if the director gets wind of this, he's just been itching for a reason to send me to the experimental ward. I'm getting better. I swear. What? The director has resigned? That can't be right. Really? You're looking for a new one? Then... Maybe there's hope after all. You promise this isn't some kind of trick? Okay then, I'll tell you what really happened to put me here. My name is Bethany Stalwart. I used to work here at Bainbridge Asylum as a nurse in the emergency surgery ward. I mostly worked day shifts because I enjoyed a pretty healthy nightlife, but I usually worked a few night shifts a month just to mix things up a bit. As you might imagine, the day shift here is often really busy. Things are a lot quieter at night, though you do have the odd emergency here and there. Like that weird girl, Alicia, what's her face? I was here working that night that that witch crazy lady nearly bled herself out. Honestly, I've never understood why crazy murderers shouldn't be allowed to off themselves. They'd be doing everyone else a favor, right? Anyway, I was working a night shift in the ES ward, chatting it up with my friend, Samantha, to pass the time more easily. You want to know all the juiciest news about what's going around Bainbridge? You talk to Samantha. If you want to know the truest versions of what's going on, well, maybe she's not the one to ask, but... She can make the night breeze by before you know it. I miss working with her. I can only imagine what she's telling people about me though. Not to be mean, but I really wish it could have been her instead. 
the whole thing came down to a coin toss, and I lost. See, earlier that night, we lost a patient that was rushed over to us from the sea ward. According to the guards on duty, the guy had jumped from his bed and had somehow landed awkwardly enough to have broken his neck. Now, I don't know if you've seen the beds over in the sea ward, but those things are no more than glorified mattresses. You tell me somebody jumps off of one of those and lands hard enough to break their neck? I call bull. But that's the story they decided to stick with, and it was really none of my business if the guards played a little too rough with some of these murderous kooks. Anyways, the guy didn't last too much longer after he arrived at the ES. Our doctor pronounced him dead and we covered him up with a sheet and moved his body over to a corner where he wouldn't be in the way. Crude, I know, but the morgue wasn't open to us at night. One of the weird rules of this place, though I think I might be starting to understand that one. So, close to three in the morning, Sarah came up to the intake desk where me and Samantha were sitting. Sarah and another nurse, Charlene, had been watching over the patients in the main recovery room. Sarah needed a cigarette break, and she asked if one of us could go sit with Charlene until she got back. No biggie. But me and Samantha were both feeling kind of lazy at the moment, so we decided to flip a coin. It was just my bad luck that the coin chose to send me to take Sarah's place that night. Any other freaking night, and you might be here talking to Sarah or Samantha, while I'd be working my day shift on ES and looking forward to another wild night out. As it was, after the coin toss, I grabbed my book of Sudoku puzzles and a pencil and went to join Charlene in recovery. I mean, Charlene was a nice girl and all, but talking to her was about the same as talking to an old dusty librarian. She had no social life to speak of and didn't have more than two words to say in response to anything you would say. Boring. I don't know how Sarah managed to work so many shifts paired up with her. It drove me crazy having to spend 10 minutes with her. I don't really mean to speak ill of the dead, and I certainly didn't want her to die. I just wish that she could have died on a different night or that someone else had discovered her. As it was, when I walked into the recovery room, I found Charlene convulsing face down in a pool of her own blood, just a few feet away from the entrance to the room. I almost cried out, should have cried out, but I guess I was shocked into silence. I was thinking like, did Sarah do this? Did she finally snap after getting stuck with Charlene for so many shifts? What if she comes back to take me out? What if she already got Samantha? while I was on my way here. Yeah, my panicked thoughts caused me to waste a few precious seconds just standing there like an idiot. But finally, my training kicked in and I rushed forward to see what kind of problem Charlene was in and what I could do to help. It was after I knelt down next to her that I caught movement to the right of me. I turned and looked up to see the patient that had died earlier standing next to the nearest patient bed and staring at me. I mean, his eyes still had the dead glaze over them, but he was definitely looking at me. He stood straight up, except that his head was still awkwardly cocked to the side and the skin of his neck looked like it didn't fit right. His jaw was hanging open and his fat bluish tongue was poking out, dry and dead. He lifted his left hand to his mouth with his pointer finger lifted, like he was trying to shush me. Then he lifted his right hand, showing me his scalpel, before slicing it down into the throat of the recovering patient that he stood next to. I choked off a scream 
in my own throat. And I mean, I swallowed it hard when the dead guy, James something or other, shuffled towards me holding that scalpel. Then I watched as he went over to the next patient's bed and did it again. I wanted to scream so bad every time he went to stab a patient, but I didn't dare make a sound because he was watching me the whole time and his finger was held up to his mouth. I was so scared and I did not want to die there in that room with a monster. I mean, I'm sure all of those patients didn't want to die there either, but they were all murderers, so they kind of deserved it. There were 11 patients recovering in that room, and not one was spared. It wasn't until the dead guy had killed the last patient that I realized I was the only target left in the room. I had hoped that he would go away and leave me alone after he was done butchering everyone else. I had been quiet and let him do his thing, after all. But once he was done with the last patient, he held up the terrible scalpel and came shuffling towards me. I suddenly didn't want to be alone anymore. And I mean, I don't think I've ever been so alone in my life. I lifted Charlene up and hugged her tightly to me. I knew she was dead at that point, but I needed to hold her anyway. And then, with the dead man almost right on top of me, I shut my eyes and screamed like my life depended on it. That's how the other nurses found me, just sitting on the floor holding a dead nurse and screaming my face off. Apparently I put up quite a fight and wouldn't let anyone touch me until they had found a way to sedate me. I mean, I was fully riled up, thinking I was about to die. I wasn't trying to hurt anybody or anything like that. I was just trying to live, but that's not how everyone else saw it. Nobody saw any of the events that happened that night my way. That's why I'm a patient here now, of course. They all think I lost my marbles and killed all those people myself that night. I mean, I was a victim. I didn't kill anybody at any time, but they all want to say that there is no other logical explanation of what happened. According to all of the staff present, and even according to video footage, there had been a temporary power outage affecting the ES ward. Get this, it's supposed to have started as I was on my way to the recovery room. Now, I know I didn't go wandering around anywhere in the dark that night. I could see everything the whole time, the lights around me never so much as flickered, let alone turn completely off. And yet, the security footage absolutely showed that everything went black in the recovery room just before the horror show began. I mean, all of the lights, the monitors, everything turned off. For some reason, even the backup power supply remained off during that time. Charlene, of course was still alive and unharmed when everything went dark. And when everything abruptly came back on, all there was to see was me surrounded by dead patients and holding a dead nurse, screaming like my hair was on fire. The dead guy was found exactly where we had placed him, still covered with a sheet. So that's it. I'm supposed to have walked into the recovery room that night under the cover of darkness and stabbed a bunch of patients and a nurse to death. Me, with my secret night vision goggles. I mean, how was I supposed to see well enough to have killed all of those people with such precision? The doctors all want to tell me that it's more plausible than a dead guy getting up and killing everyone without getting a drop of blood on him and going back to rest exactly as he was before so no one would notice. Well, I beg to differ. I know what I saw, and I know that I don't belong here. Please, tell the next director what I told you. Tell him that this is not justice, and that I am not crazy. I can't stay here. 
the most frightful things happen here all the time now. I mean, working here for a shift is so different from being here 24-7. I get to witness a lot more of the action now. It's like this place just soaked up all of the crazy from the patients living in this damn asylum. The new director needs to know this. He needs to know that this place isn't normal. And that he has to let me out. Please.